Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. InshaAllah, inshaAllah. Let's try it one more time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah, I'm sorry. Uh, Allah, you hit me with it. Allah loves with it. So, we're going to have to do it one more time. And as we say in, in the South, one more time. Right? I know you think I'm like, from the South. How many people in the South are like cowboys and. No? That myth is gone? Okay, let's do it. Right. Right. One more time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I'm here with all of you and that I thank all of you as well for putting this event together. I see that it's every year, mashallah, tabarakallah, that all of you, mashallah, collegiates and otherwise come together to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remember his greatness, to come together upon his remembrance and to leave upon his remembrance. You know, subhanAllah, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing when we look at the word dhikr. And dhikr is that which is remembrance, but it's a manifestation of remembering God, remembering him in your heart, remembering him in your, with your tongue, remembering him with your limbs. All of that is a manifestation of remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, when you remember, when you reflect, you connect. When you reflect on God's beautiful names and attributes, you connect with him. So the topic that I wanted to talk about, inshallah ta'ala, that was given to me was the essence of leadership. But I'm going to kind of go in a little on one aspect of leadership, which is important in regards to leadership in essence. When we look at leadership, leadership is what is known in Arabic as qiyada. It can be known as that which is a person that leads somewhere. And the person that is a leader of obviously or ultimately is the message of Allah Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, being that he is a Rasul and he is a Nabi. He is the one that has been given the message and he is the one that has been ordered to relate this message to the people. But I want to talk about two particular aspects in regards to uh, a leader. Well, one particular concept, but that concept I want to break it up into two things, the two things that are needed to manifest it. And that is confidence. When we talk about confidence or self esteem, it is important that the one that is a leader or wants to understand the essence of leading someone or people is to be very confident. They have to be confident in who they are and what they represent. And particularly, all of you, uh, what's the mascot here? Is it Spartans or something? Knights. Knights? Oh, yes. Okay. I was at MSU a couple days, Michigan State. They're the Spartans. Yeah. The Knights. Not the days, but the nights, mashallah to barakallah. Now, especially if you are a knight here, because you will face or have faced a lot of, dare we even say, stereotypes. People may look at you and think a certain way. And that can affect your confidence. The way that you think about yourself, the way that you may have projected upon others a certain type of thought or experience and it can affect a relationship. So when we talk about this word of confidence, in Arabic it's thiqatun bin nafs. And thiqa means something that is tight, something that is hard to break. So when there's thiqatun bin nafsi, means that you are strong within yourself. You have a tight connection, but there's a small distinction that is so important for the Muslim. It's so important for the Muslim. Because a lot of times, many of us may read self-help books, books on self-actualization, being the best version of yourself, we hear a lot of days, a lot of times. But that small, distinct connection makes the world a difference. So when talking about this confidence, the first thing we want to understand that we must have is that of consistency. Everyone say it. One more time. Consistency. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in a beautiful hadith, and I love this hadith. It's a beautiful, beautiful hadith because it reminds us to be consistent and it reminds us 
that this consistency is beloved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that which is beloved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the goal for us as human beings is for that beloved thing by Allah to be beloved to us. You know, Shaykh Islam and Taymiyyah, he mentions in his book, Servitude and Rudiyya, he says, فَإِنَّ مِنْ تَمَامِ مُحَبَّةً مَحَبَّةً 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 He says, it is from the perfect aspect or perfect sign of loving the beloved or beloved is to love what the beloved loves. When you love what your beloved loves, that is a true sign of love. So when we love what Allah loves, this is when we have reached that level of love that is beautiful, that is life-changing, that has a rippling effect on those around you. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, أَحَبُّ الْأَعْمَالِ إِلَى اللَّهِ أَدْوَمُهَا وَإِنْ قَلْ he said, the most beloved actions to Allah are the ones that are consistent, even if they were a little bit, just a little bit. You know, subhanAllah, uh, my wife sent me a text today. I have, a, I have a nine-year-old, and he thinks he's a baller. You know, he thinks he's a baller. You know, I take him out a couple days after school. We get the little three-pound ball. He's dribbling. He's, you know, acting like he's somebody. I don't know. Definitely someone in the NBA. But she sent me a picture, he was like right in front of the three-point line and there were two people on him who just turned and threw the ball up like a real advanced shot and it went straight through the net. You can hear people in the audience, whoa, look at that. You know, so when I called him today right before the lecture, I said, look, you gotta be consistent. You gotta be consistent. You gotta keep doing it. You're gonna get better. And that's exactly what this Prophet Sallallahu what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying here, that Allah loves when you are consistent. But what brings a lot of hope a lot of hope for us that falls short many times in our life every single day. He says, Wa in qal. Everyone, wa in? Wa in? Come on, I need some, I need some touch weed with it. Like some, wa in qal. No. Qal comes from qalil. And qalil means a little bit. It's so beautiful at the very end because he says, you know what? Allah loves the actions that are consistent. I'm going to ask a question. Do not raise your hand. Okay? Do not raise your hand. How many of you did not offer all of your salats today? Don't raise your hand. Very good. <laughs> right? So, that is so important, the salawats, the prayers, five times a day. The Prophet ﷺ gives an example for the one, he says, have you seen a person that has a river in front of their house? In front of their house. And they were to wash in that river five times a day. Would there be any done? Would there be any dirt on that individual? And obviously it's a rhetorical question, but they said, Ya la ya Rasulullah, there wouldn't be any dirt on him. He said, this is like the, the salawat. It wipes away the sins. Washes them away. And what's interesting is he says a river. And a river, it's a dafak. It goes with a, a, with a flow, a heavy flow, current. So when looking at the salawat, looking at the prayers, and looking at how it's every single day. Well, I remember I mentioned this in MSU, and I always remind myself and all of you. When I converted to Islam, the Libyan sheikh in my masjid, he was a math man. He was a, he was the head of the math department. And he was telling me about Islam. And then he said, you know, we have to pray five times a day. In my mind, I'm thinking, what? Every single day? Five times? You know, there was something called rollover minutes back in the day. I don't know if you still like rollover. If you don't use your minutes on your phone, you can roll them over and get them later. Yeah, and if you don't use your 100 minutes today, use 50. You can use a 50 for the next day. So in my mind, I was thinking to ask him, is there some like rollover salawat? Like if I don't make my four today, can I delay that till tomorrow? But when I thought about it, I said, SubhanAllah. I didn't say SubhanAllah at that time, but I was like, wow. I was like, wow. Because I had to stop and be responsible and say, if I was to do this five times a day with full attention, or if I was to even try my best to be attentive of God, five minutes, five times a day, I know I would change. 
I know I would change for the better. I think all of us know that here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, after a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, وَأْمُرْ أَهْلَكَ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَاسْطَبِرْ عَلَيْهَا لَا نَسْأَلُكَ رِسْقًا نَحْنُ نَرْزُقُكَ وَالْعَاقِبَةُ لِلْتَّقْرِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says here, وَأْمُرْ أَهْلَكَ بِالصَّلَاةِ And order your family, meaning the people that are around you, the people that you are calling to the faith, order them with prayer. But then he says, وَاسْطَبِرْ عَلَيْهَا مَا قَالَ وَاسْبِرْ قَالَ وَاسْطَبِرْ وَزِيَادَةُ الْمَبْنَى تَدُلُّ عَلَى زِيَادَةُ الْمَعْنَى He says here, order your family to pray and have perseverance with them or have perseverance on it or with it, i.e. with the prayer. Meaning that it's not just patience, it's patience ala mad al over a long period of time, you're going to have to be patient, brothers and sisters. For the period of your life, there's gonna be those fudges where you wake up and the sun is in your face. There's gonna be times when you're tired and you gotta go make wudu to make isha before you go to sleep. But then you think just something, I got to, but I don't really want to. That is a test. That is the test in and of itself. But that consistency, the consistency, is what is so beautiful. That is what Allah loves. The fact that you're consistent. And when you become consistent with that which Allah loves, you become a leader of yourself. Why of yourself? Because if you do not choose to lead yourself, someone or something else will lead you. This is full of information. Isn't that so? The price of information is your attention. And when your attention is distracted, you lose focus. The ultimate distraction is shaitan, is shirk. That's the ultimate distraction from your ultimate purpose of life. And someone that leads their life knows their purpose. And that is the small distinction that I'm talking about. When we see those that don't believe in Allah and those that do. Because their ultimate purpose is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Their ultimate purpose is that life has a meaning. There's a meaning of life and there's meaning in life. The meaning of life is وَمَا خَلَقَتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ where Allah says, I have not created the jinn, the spirits, and mankind, except that they worship me. That's the purpose of life. That's the meaning of life. The substance, your anchor is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When times are hard, not, not if, but when times get hard, you turn to Allah. You turn to those beautiful names and attributes. You remember those times when you were down and you don't even remember how you gotten out of it. You turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You remember those beautiful names and attributes. You remember His grace, His mercy, His love, His honor. All of those beautiful names. His guidance. When we say, Ihdina Silaq al Mustaqim. When you say, Ihdina Silaq al Mustaqim, paint a picture in your mind of a time that you ask God, why God? But you're there in Salah asking Him to guide you to the straight path. That's what we're talking about. That small distinction is what differentiates all of you from those that don't believe in God. Or those that think that God is like a human being. That purpose of life, that's the meaning of life. That is what is important to keep you consistent. Because if not, you will find your validation in other than him, in a person, place, or other thing that will eventually perish. It says, Allah says, everything will perish on this earth. Do not make the purpose, your purpose of life, a person. It should be to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to impress Allah. And the best way to impress him is to take that which nourishes, which nourishes your soul, which nourishes your fitrah. And that is literally what the word sharia means. It means linguistically a water hole or channels of water that reach a body of water. And that body of water, are you going to that body of water to replenish yourself? 
Are you using that which Allah has given you, your motherboard, your fitrah? Are you nourishing your fitrah with the sharia? That's the system God has given you to tell him, thank you. The best way to say thank you to Allah is to take what he has given you. Ya Yahya, khud al-kitaba bi Allah told Yahya to take the book with strength, with strength, with strength to hold on to it tightly because you will be tested. You will be tested. Other things will try to take your honor. Other things, other people will try to lead you. The question is, are you allowing it to lead you? The question is, when you feel down, when you feel stressed, where are you going? What are you resorting to? And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ultimately has to be your anchor, the one that you turn to at all times. And you reach that point by being consistent, even if it was a little bit. That small distinction of Allah being my ultimate goal, what Allah wants is what I want. That is what is so important. And you are going to fall victim, you're going to ask questions about God sometimes. That's human. That is human. But what do you resort to? It's going to be that which you consistently consult and visit. And the best visit is when you detach from distractions and say, Allahu Akbar. This is why it is impermissible to have any type of kalam, any worldly speech when you are in prayer. Allah is asking you, detach from distractions, detach from that which takes you away from my remembrance. Detach from that at least five times a day. And when you're consistent with that within this world of detaching and tuning in and remembering Allah with the dhikr of the heart, with the khushur, the undivided attention, with the dhikr of the tongue, by reciting the words he's giving you, with the dhikr of the limbs, by moving, standing, prostrating, bowing. Five times a day, this will change you without a doubt. In the salata, tanha'na fahshari wal munka. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the prayer relinquishes bad and evil and lewd deeds. So the first thing is with the leader, the essence of leadership, is someone that is consistent, someone that is consistent, someone that is consistent. But that consistency must be founded in worshiping Allah, knowing who Allah is, and knowing who He is not, who He says He is not. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in a beautiful verse, <clears throat> when He talks about subhanAllah uh, uh, being of the ones that are elevated, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions those that are elevated in a high status. When he mentions the ones that are at a high status, that high status is because of their iman. And that iman is that which brings us closer to him, but that iman, as we mentioned earlier, is our anger. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran the beautiful verse regarding being of those that are above and that are above everyone else, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, when speaking about the greatness of his, of his, of his majesty, he calls them, uh, saying that they, they will be of the, uh, of the people that are at the high, lofty status. And that lofty status is based on Iman. So when we look at the Iman from Allah, uh, the Iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we understand that is our anchor and that's what we turn to. Because the word Iman in and of itself comes from Aman, which is safety. When one looks at the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they turn to them, they find a level of Sakina, a level of tranquility. When they resort to the words of Allah, to the remembrance of Allah, they find Itumitnan, Allah bidikillahi. It's a rhetorical question. It's a question to where we know the answer. Only the ones that know Allah and understand who Allah is know the answer. Is it, Allah says, is it not with the remembrance of Allah that the hearts find ease? That the hearts find ease. 
finding that tranquility. SubhanAllah, how many sisters that I've known, SubhanAllah, Allah has, one sister I knew, SubhanAllah, three times was not blessed with a child. But now she has three children. Each occasion, when I say SubhanAllah, inna lillahi wa lillahi wa she said, Alhamdulillah, this is what Allah's will. I'm, I'm, I'm okay with this, I'm okay, I'm content. Because I know Allah is the one that ultimately gives me the child, and He's ultimately the one that can take him away. So in realizing this consistency that we have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, turning and recognizing the second thing, and that is belief in his qadr. In his qadr. So the first thing is consistency in your iman, in your belief, and knowing who Allah is. And by the way, the best way to resort, return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to un know and understand his names and attributes. This is so important for you. To understand what the name means, the action of that name, how it is manifested in your life, and how that increases your iman. For example, we said Al-Hadi. Allah is the one that guides. He is the ultimate guide. When we hear Khutbah al Hajj, when the Prophet says, May yahdihillahu fala mudillala. Whoever Allah guides, there is no misguider for him. Whether it's a person, whether it is an ism, nihilism, racism, socialism, any type of ism is not my guide. There is nothing that will misguide me. The Prophet said, La mudilla. Like you see, La ilaha. It is called La nafi al jins. You are negating any type of that noun, any type. He said, Man that there is nothing that will misguide him. So when Allah guides, there is nothing that can stop. So looking at that name Al Hadi, we think about money, a person, our emotions that we let guide us. Have you seen the Allah says, have you seen the person that takes his uh, his, his his desires, his or her desires as their Lord? as their Lord. Just stop and think about that. Your desires, do we control our desires or do we let them control us? On this device again. Do we control our desires on this device or do we let, do we control it or do we let it control us? So when looking at this, subhanAllah, belief in the Qadr and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is so important. And one will understand how it can be challenging to believe in the predestination of Allah. Basically what Allah has predestined to happen. Because when we understand predestination, we have to know the knowledge of Allah. Another name of Allah is Al-Alim. Everyone say it. One more time. One more time. You gotta make sure all of you are awake. Okay. Al Alim. Oh, mashallah. Okay. Okay. Bismillah. That was four. One more. One more. Allah. What does the name of Al Alim mean in English? The All What? The All Knowing. You know, I'm very interactive. I used to, I like to walk around and stuff, so I'm just going to actually get y'all involved here. Who can explain in an elevator pitch, like in one sentence, what that means. Anyone? Do I have to stand here? Oh, because of the camera? Come on. Go ahead. No. Exactly. So he mentioned a portion of a verse. And that's a beautiful verse which explains his knowledge. He said, Allah is the source of all knowledge and not a leaf falls from a tree. And that goes, that goes back to a verse, a beautiful verse in the Quran. SubhanAllah, where Allah SWT says, After a'udhu billah min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, wa ma tasqutu min waraqatin illa ya'lamuha. I have to say the whole verse because it's so, it's so deep. He said, Allah says that there is not a leaf that falls from a tree except that he knows it. Allah says there is not a leaf 
that falls from the tree except that he knows it. And not a seed in the depths of the ground. And then he mentions the status of the seed. And the seed in the ground right now. Seeds in the ground. He is knowledgeable of every seed. But on top of that, just to, just to give you a snippet of how deep his knowledge is and how, 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 how subhanAllah, dip is good Like, it's very, very expansive and precise. He says, even if the seed is damp or moist, except that it is in a written tablet, being the Lord and Mahfud, the preserved tablet, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written everything that is going to happen. There is an, an ex explanation of what the scholars give in regards to the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They say it is very comprehensive. And some scholars add, they say Allah knows what was. Allah knows what, huh? what will be. Right? What was, we can say what is, what will be. Okay? And he knows what hasn't been. If it was to have been, how it would have been. Right? Did any of you all get run over by an ice cream truck on the way here? You're supposed to say no because you can answer the question. <laughs> okay? Right. Okay. If that was to happen, Allah knows how it would have happened. It may not have been an ice cream truck. It may have been you know, a Rutgers two-wheeler, one wheeler. A night two-wheeler, one wheeler or something. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware of all things. Nothing, he is unaware of nothing. Everything that happens on this earth, Allah is aware of it. There was a young man that I was teaching, subhanAllah, and he asked me the question, he said, you know, the common question is, why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala order us to do something, we do the, prohibit us from doing something, we do that prohibited action, and then punish us for it. I asked one question, is it, do you believe in God? He said, yes. Is it befitting to say God does not know dot dot dot? No. That's what he said too. <laughs> but he said, no, it's, it's not befitting to. Exactly. The knowledge of God is so vast. It is not a condition for you to know everything that God knows. It, many of you are in college now or any classroom. You walk into the classroom, you almost are certain that the instructor knows more than you. You're certain that the instructor knows more than you. But there is a possibility that later in life you may know more than the instructor. Maybe. But with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, being that we believe, another beautiful name, that he has created everything. And Allah creating everything means, means that he brought something from nothing. This podium here is made from wood and paint and maybe some glue from some trees in a Rutgers Park somewhere. Or New Brunswick, right? Yeah. But these trees already existed. We did not and do not and will not create, create anything. We will only manipulate Allah's creation. So if Allah has brought things into existence, isn't he going to need the most knowledgeable of it? So everything he brought into existence, he is going to be the most knowledgeable of it. Just the fact of thinking of creation. We don't even create our, we can't even create ourselves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, and in your own selves, do you not see, do you not ponder, even in yourself, pondering over your anatomy and your physiology. Anatomy is the actual, you know, structure of our body, our body parts. But how they function is a whole other thing. Allah is, is the one that created it, and He is well aware of it. Therefore, He has ultimate control over it. This is why some of the scholars of the Fuqaha, they said, therefore, it is impermissible, it is not allowed for a human being to sell, what? Their own body parts. What was the illa behind it? What was the reasoning behind it? Because you do not ultimately own it. You are not the ultimate, ultimate owner of your own self. 
Because if it was up to you, تَكُونُ مِنَ الْخَالِدِينَ You would live forever. Who wants to live forever? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one that has ultimate control. So when looking at the fact that Allah is the creator, the maintainer, the sustainer, how would he not have knowledge of it and everything around it and everything that affects it and everything that it will affect and, 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 and. So when we take a step and we look at Qadr, we look at the predestination of Allah, there has to be an ounce of haya, of shyness in our hearts. How can I question God? How? And for someone that wants to lead, there's someone is aware of the knowledge of Allah, the creation of Allah, the power of Allah, the wisdom of Allah. What is the name of Allah that deals with his wisdom? <laughs> he can't hear you. Al Hakim, Ahsantum. Al Hakim. The connection with Al Hakim and Al Alim is that Allah appropriates His knowledge at a time or at a place, however He wills, subhanAllah. He appropriates it. He chooses to make something happen when and where He wants to. We worship Allah on his terms, not on our terms. That is so important. I want to lead my life. You lead your life, but when something happens and doesn't go according to your plan, what happens to your belief in Allah? It is okay to be down at times and say, I tried my best. I've studied so hard. I've looked so hard for a spouse. I've worked out so much, I've eaten so so much, I've memorized this Quran, I've tried to memorize so so much, so many days, but I'm not getting the results that I want. I saw this hadith, I heard this hadith that when you're consistent, Allah loves it, but I'm not getting the results that I want. The results that you want is one thing. What Allah wants may be something else. Perhaps you may love something that is bad for you. And perhaps you may dislike something that is. And then Allah says what? He, he ends it by saying what? Allah knows and you don't know. Allah knows and you don't know. One beautiful, beautiful thing about the Quran. And there's many endless jewels of the Quran that we within our lifetime will never encompass all of them because it's part of Allah's knowledge. Is that he ends a verse, verses by mentioning qawaid, rules, guidelines for you about him. So here he says there may be something that you uh, dislike, but it's good for you. There may be something that you like, and it's bad for you. So you may know this, but then Allah reminds you, Allah knows and you don't know. That is a general rule for all of us, a guideline in regards to God and his knowledge and his wisdom and our purpose in life. So it's very important for us to be individuals that believe in the father of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the predestination of Allah. And that is the second element of confidence, being consistent and believing in the other. Consistent primarily, not just of the actions, but of the seed of the actions, as we mentioned, believing in God and who he is. And there's going to be struggles with that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a beautiful, beautiful verse in regards to believing in his qadr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, after a'udhu billahi min shaytan rajim in the chapter of Nisa, verse number 54, am nasa ala ma atahu min fadli? Do they have hasad? Hasad. Hasad. You know what I'm going to ask you, right? Say the word hasad. Hasad, exactly. What is hasad in English? Translates. Jealousy? Envy? Yes. 
So Allah is asking a question, and it's for you to think about like, whoa, the first time I read this verse, I said, oh, the way that he puts it, subhanAllah. He says, do they have envy or do they envy mankind from what Allah has given them from his virtue? Just think about that. You know, there's, there's, there's types of envy. There's good envy and there's bad envy. Of the bad envy, there's even, some mentioned two types. The first type is to where you want what that person has and you want it to be taken away from them. This person received a good job. We just graduated. I have a higher GPA than this person. How in the world did he get this job? How in the world did she get married to this individual? How? I'm better than him or her. Because see, sometimes we have to be very, very careful if we want to lead our lives appropriately. When you ask, how did this person get so, how did this person? Is it how? You don't want to know. Or is it how did this person? You see the attitude? It can be subconsciously belittling ihtiqar shakhs, belittling someone, which is a sign, can be a sign of arrogance. So when Allah is asking this question, we look at the separate second type of envy as well. The second type of envy is to where you just don't want that person to have that virtue. It doesn't matter if you get it or not, you just don't want them to have it. Ahmed can have it, but Muhammad, no. No. Fatima can have that, but Khadija, no way. Over my alive body. <laughs> not her. No, please not her. Anyone but her. Right? But Allah is reminding you, He is the repository of good. He is the repository of fadl. Atahumullahu min fadli. The word fadl in and of itself is amazing. Fadl, if we were to look in, in books of fiqh, sometimes they say fadl is ma tabaqiya min shaykh. Like if I was to drink all this water, okay, or make wudu with this water, what is left over is the fadl, or the fadl. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you something, it is an indirect expression that shows ultimately there is no form of reciprocity. That when Allah does something, you give back and it is equal. It will always be extra. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving you more than you quote unquote, quote unquote deserve. We don't want to use the word, I deserve this from Allah. Because it is a virtue, he gives it to you. It's just important for you to take that small window of responsibility of thanking him. And how do you connect? Reflect, vigor, remembrance of Allah. Remembering his beautiful names, being consistent in that. And one of the strongest ways is praying five times a day after the prayer remembering his name, the Sharia, as was mentioned before. So in looking at this beautiful qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his predestination, this is how one ultimately, ultimately will obtain the essence of leadership, primarily of being a leader of their own lives. Because many times we have to stop and look in the mirror and ask, am I leading my own life? Do I allow other people to validate me? Do I feel lesser of a person? If I don't get enough likes on Facebook, Twitter, Mitter, whatever else there is. Is it social media that I find my validation? Is it a person that I find my validation? Is it a concept outside of Islam that I find my validation? When, not if, I feel down. When a loved one passes away. When a dear friend passes away. Do I blame time? Do I blame Allah? Am I mad at God? You know, I just came from Michigan State University and we spoke about Malcolm X. And you know, he mentions in his autobiography, if you have not read the autobiography of Malcolm X, I highly implore you to read the autobiography of Malik al-Shabazz, Malcolm X. He mentions at a point when he was in jail before he became a Muslim, how he used to love solitary confinement. And he would stand and walk and pace and scream and curse at God and the Bible to the degree that the inmates gave him a nickname. Satan, that was his nickname. 
with Satan until his brothers and sisters, his biological brothers, has called him to the deen of the Ummah al Islamiyah, the nation of Islam, because it had a relevance in changing the mind state of the African American. He got out of jail, and we know the rest of the story. And if we do, if you do not, I highly implore you to read the autobiography of Malcolm X, written by Alex Haley, told to Alex Haley by Malcolm X. So it's by Malcolm X, autobiography. This is important, and I want to end here. When understanding the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you start to hear his speech, when he goes to the chapter called Mecca, when he talk, talks about his pilgrimage, and how he realized that all nationalities, that the white man was not the devil, rather it was a psychology than an actual person. It was an understanding of debasement of a genus of people, of a type of people, particularly those that came from West Africa, generally took them from West Africa and brought them to the Americas, quote unquote, and dehumanized them, dehumanized them. Can you imagine, as we see nowadays in certain places, they take you from your land, they do horrendous things to you, they call a grown man like myself in front of my children, boy. They call me a boy in front of my children, they whip me in front of everyone. What can that do to someone's confidence? Not at that moment, over generations. Over generations. This is what Malcolm was reminding the people. Revisionist history of white America at that time that has that psychology of oppressing people and is not admitting to it. But that which liberated, we, want, we don't want to say liberated, we want to say where Malcolm evolved and as he even used in his own words, broadened his understanding of Islam, he got in touch with his anchor, the universal anchor, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not to call Allah an anchor, but that which we see, which we ultimately turn to. The characteristics of the anchor is that which when the turbulence comes, there's something that holds us, that keeps us stabbed, that keeps us firm, that keeps us confident, that keeps us consistent, that keeps us in trust in his beautiful names and attributes. And that's exactly why we say after the name Malika Shabazz, Malcolm X, what do we say? Rahimahullah. May Allah have mercy on him, because without a doubt, Without a doubt, brothers and sisters, it was him that brought the name, the word Islam into this country, if not the first one on a general scale on the mainstream level, was that man. So when we look at the essence of leadership, the embodiment of leadership, even though he wasn't the leader of the nation, he definitely was a leader of his own life. He definitely was someone, as I love to say, and I will end here, he used, which I, I, I mentioned this on how we live our purpose, is he used the external to purify his internal for the eternal. He used everything on this earth, the knowledge, his resources. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He is the one that has created everything for you to use on this earth to purify his internal, to purify his heart. And that purification comes with trials and tribulations. But just as the Imam spread, particularly Shaykh Islam to me, he mentions this, with patience and certainty you will reach leadership or be triumphant in the religion. So purifying the internal, his heart, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At one time it was for a certain genus of people, but then when it transitioned, he evolved to where that purification was for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in conclusion, brothers and sisters, saddidu wa qaribu, al-qastu al-qastu tabluhu. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, be consistent. Aim for the mark. Aim for the to, to be close or hit that mark. 
And he said, Al Qastu, Al Qastu Tabu, take your time, you will reach your goal. But the question is, what is your ultimate goal? In order to lead, you have to be going somewhere. All of us have an, a, a, a date that we were born, and there is a dash. What are we doing in that dash to where when we go to a particular place? As Fadil ibn Iyad said, he asked the man how old he was. The man said, I'm 60. He said, He asked the man how old he was. The man said, I'm 60. His response, he said, for 60 years, you have been traveling to your Lord and you're almost there. So all of us are on a journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Make sure that we are leading and that we are following at the same time the ultimate leader, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and allowing the sunnah to lead us. Barakallahu feekum. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.